To start, you must know that vocal emission and its control have always fascinated me. I don't care if we talk about singers, actors or actresses or public speakers. I love to think about the ability and skills all these people must have when they talk in front of an audience. Breathing, use of the diaphragm, etc. Actually, if we think about it, the voice is probably the most powerful tool we all have while we relate to others. It's our visiting card. We usually take this for granted, but the way we talk, the eye the contents, it's very important. And in this regards, there are lots of books about vocal emissions. We should remember the acting technique by Stanislavski or Strasberg, for example, or why not, book about marketing that usually help you to be convincing, seductive, and overall a winner. A word that I don't like very much, to be honest. Anyway, I stop here because I don't want to be ridiculous with my personal intro, or at least not too much ridiculous. So I'll get to the point, finally introducing the subject of today's episode that, of course, it will not be about vocal emissions, but about a different kind of emissions. The emissions that can sometimes be promoted by surface protection treatments. Please take comfort in knowing that this scenario is really uncommon, but it will help us on reasoning and making reflections about emissions, ceramic surfaces, and intended use. So, let's breathe and start. I am Davide Trentini, and this is Apparently Invisible, Chemistry in Ceramics. As usual, let's start from the beginning with a short and general introduction about surface protective treatments. Since we have already extensively talked about it in the previous episode, I'll be quick. Polished and lapped ceramic tiles usually require specific protection treatments to clog the open pores that may have emerged on the surface after the lapping or polishing process. This protection, of course, is fundamental to avoid or at least to reduce possible chemical or dirty attacks. The target of surface treatments, once again, is to protect the surface, improving its performance without changing the features of the tie. And more generally, ties, treated or not treated, must comply with the regulations and target of the market that obviously can change according to the client and the intended use of ceramics. We are basically saying that target market, unlike regulations, can be defined time to time, and so they are discretionary. For example, ceramic tile used in supermarkets or airports, that of course are high traffic areas, must meet targets that are different from those required in a private house or in a pub. This is the reason why we can talk not only about official rules, but also about internal rules set by ceramic producers that define the features that a surface must have. And in this respect, in recent years, new regulations have appeared on the market due to the increasingly different intended uses of the ceramic material. What do I mean? I mean that the increasing of ceramic dimensions or size, together with an incredible, incredible sorry, amount of possibilities promoted by digital technologies, think about, for example, the stunning reproduction of natural materials, such as marble, opens the ceramic material to new application areas. And the first in line, of course, is in the field of interior, table, worktops, countertop, etc., etc. And in many cases, these new scenarios call into question some new guidelines that define the technical feature that ceramics should have in case of food content. And here we are, food content. Let's now add a new element. Speaking about food contact, words like sanitization and cleanliness that already belong to the ceramic production have today new connotations that shouldn't be taken for granted, especially when the material is not used for floors and walls. Today, in fact, despite their outstanding and very high hygienic performances, ceramic surfaces must be even more carefully checked to avoid and prevent possible toxic releases that may affect, by contact, the food we eat and therefore resulting in harmful effect on humans. This is a topic that, with very good and obvious reasons, ceramic producers have never addressed, but that today, 
practice, despite the extraordinary hygienic performances of ceramics, we think should be taken in agenda. Because even if toxic releases are very low and not harmful, it is important to rise the bar even more of quality and performance to meet the regulations that are today increasingly demanding. And this is the reason why ceramic producers and chemical and chemical companies that supply products for surface treatments must be aware and carefully above regulation. That said, let's now enter the world of tests and checks. Starting from the idea that surfaces must not release any kind of toxic compounds for food and therefore for humans, dyes must undergo two lab tests by means of chemical agents that replicate the acidity and alkalinity of foods that help to check over a period that can range from a few hours to a few days the possible release of toxic and carbon elements. I don't want to be too specific because the field is very complex and varied, so we can say that in general current regulations provide for limits in terms of releases that cannot be exceeded. Limits that are measured in ppm parts per millions and that can change depending on the context. These limits also may concern some specific substances or the entire amounts of compounds that are released. This means, for example, that some entities, unlike or more than others, can require specific limits for cadmium or selenium, setting at the same time other limits that check together the release of all elements together and their possible compounds. That said, the question now is, what are the elements that can be found on the ceramic surface and that should be previously checked by producers to avoid possible releases. Let's try to make a list that of course is incomplete but that takes into consideration the most important element. First, grits and fritz composition. Second, composition of all chemicals used for grit applications. Third, composition of all chemicals used along the entire production process. And fourth, composition of the product used for the surface protection treatments. Okay, now we have the list, but it is also important to underline that this approach makes sense when materials and compounds that must be checked do not undergo to a firing cycle that can transform and change their features. In ceramic, in fact, these kinds of controls are not very significant since the tiles, before entering the market, undergo inside the kilns to very high temperature that almost completely transform the initial composition of the material, including their possible interaction with foods. However, the method of analysis is useful and it is valid with respect to surface treatment that, in fact, take place only after firing therefore without undergoing to any kind of thermal transformation after application. And this means that the surface treatments formulation must be carefully developed not only in terms of detection from chemical and stain attacks, but also in terms of possible emissions that the protective product discharge on the ceramic surface may promote. Okay. But before addressing the topic surface treatments, let's make a brief reference also to another important topic. The raw materials that make up the raw ceramic body, and more specifically the elements that form the surface of the tie that is more exposed to contact. In general, the ceramic glass, regardless its chemical composition that can frequently change, must be the most resistant as possible to chemical agents so to avoid solubilizations of those elements on the surface that, even if they are not potentially toxic, can be a problem in case of an excessive or non-standard amounts. What does that mean? I try to tell you differently. The ceramic glass, as we know, mostly consists in a list of elements that come from silica, aluminium, calcium, magnesium, lithium, sodium, potassium, etc. All these elements, each of them in different amounts, are potentially present on the surface of the tie and they could be released during the tests when simulating an acid or alkaline attack. According to producer needs or to regulations, the tie 
and the total amounts of the compounds that have been released may sometimes exceed the maximum allowed by the rules. And to be clear, the presence of this element is very, very rare, but in very special and we could say unfortunate cases, it may happen. And this is enough to proceed with proper checks to prevent extreme situations. As we have already said, the protective product that is discharged on the ceramic surface by the brushes of the application machine, even if it does not undergo to any thermal alteration, it remains, from a chemical point of view, almost unchanged after application. But that's not all. Colloidal silica, that are the basis of surface protection products, or at least of most of them, once they have lost their liquid part, that is the solvent, and they bind the ceramic surface, filling the open porosity, produce seals of amorphous silica. I repeat it, amorphous silica that must not be confused with crystalline silica. Basically, the water evaporates and what remains is the glass that binds to the ceramic surface. This is a very important detail because amorphous silica is not toxic. In fact, since amorphous silica is a polymeric glass in aqueous solvent, it does not spread any VOC, neither during nor after application. This could happen instead when using some other and different chemicals, both water and solvent based. So, it's comforting to know that the treated surface, in most cases, is suitable for food contact. The tests on colloidal silica within protected product usually show an outstanding resistance to acid attack and a weak, if not very weak, resistance to alkaline attack. What does that mean? It means that in the solution used to simulate the alkaline attack, we may find the presence of solubilized silica, that is silica released by the ceramic surface, that even if it's not toxic or harmful for humans, it could affect the effectiveness of the treatment. This is very challenging for R&D labs since they must work, and they are already doing, on solutions able to develop a higher resistance to alkaline attack that currently is still a, a little bit weak. The goal can be reached by adding to the formula polymers, resins and or wax that can support or even replace the good action of colloidal silica. This is the reason why it is important to previously test these elements or the substances, checking carefully possible release after application, that is, after the reaction that develops on the tile surface. This also needs to simulate what happens after the application of the protective product, verifying the stability and durability of the product. One of the most important targets is in fact to avoid, even with this kind of chemicals, the presence of BOC. Of course, they can be present during application, but they must disappear after the process. It is finally essential to prevent, even with these products, the presence over time of oligomers or monomers that may be harmful by promoting instead the use of non-toxic self cross linking polymers, whose non-toxicity must be present both before and after the reaction that takes place on the surface. Of course, this approach is important not only for companies that provide chemicals, but also for all glaze and color producers that should give their contribution by helping studying and developing glasses that do not produce any harmful emission after firing. Under this reflection that, as we have already said, are definitely comforting, let's end our episode with a final detail about protective treatments by talking about dyers. You surely know that products for surface treatments are usually marked by a neutral color. This is because a neutral color does not compromise the aesthetic features of the surface. However, if you want to reach a better result and a higher performing result, it is possible to add within the solution some specific dyers that match the general color of the tie. In this regard, the chemical compositions of dyers should not be underestimated since its presence may release substances, after treatment of course, in case of superficial contact with acid or alkaline solutions. Sometimes the dyers can be released by the surface even in case of aqueous solution and this exactly the reason why a great attention during the product's formulation is essential. The dyer must be chemically and physically bound inside the protective product 
to be more resistant to external agents and release tests. And this is one of the goals of the entire ceramic sector. And with this last focus, our journey ends here. I would like to remind you, as usual, that all the previous episodes are freely available not only on the main platforms, but also, together with many other contents, on our app that you can download for free on Apple Store or Google Play. You just need to type Z and S Ceramco, C-E-R-A-M-C-O. And now, I work on my diaphragm, and with a loud and singing voice, I say, see you soon.